Good afternoon. Uh, we were waiting a few minutes for the students who are just getting out of class, but I think we'll go ahead and start. Thank you all for uh, being here. This is our uh, first entrepreneurship conference. Um, we are going to have two panels today, uh, really generated by the students who understand what it's like coming out of Darden and being an entrepreneur. But the question was, what does it look like if you go have a career and then decide to be an entrepreneur? And um, I argue it can be easier because you've now got some experience. Maybe you have a spouse who earns a living. On the other hand, it can be harder because you've had a job and you have a spouse and maybe you have a child. And so it can go either way. So I thought it would be interesting to have students uh, hear from people who've done it. The second panel are, is going to be from serial entrepreneurs, people who've done it more than once, talking about <laughs> what is it that you do on try three that you didn't do on try one. And then tomorrow morning, we're going to have a clean tech um, panel. Um, we're going to have an introduction by Tom Scalak, who is really changing UVA in some very major ways. And he's going to talk about what he's doing. Um, and then in the afternoon, we're going to have the UVA Cup, which is a new event. Um, we've always done a concept competition here at Darden, but very few people from grounds would come over. We generally have people from the medical school, but we decided that a way to push entrepreneurship out into the rest of the UVA community would be to get other schools to do their own concept competitions. And sure enough, uh, nine schools agreed to do it. There are six finalists, and uh, at McIntyre tomorrow, uh, they will compete against one another for the UVA Cup, which was actually being created as we speak. Uh, I had a panic phone call last night. We were not sure they were going to get it done, but a group of uh, engineers and artists are actually creating the UVA Cup. Again, fostering this notion that entrepreneurial thinking is about teamwork and interdisciplinary effort. Um, there are a couple of people I want to thank. Um, folks from the EVC Club, Brian Rainey, Leif Glenn, Mark Taylor, did a lot of work in terms of getting this put together. Uh, Matt Gunther from the E Society. If you don't know, this is an organization that was created at UVA last year to connect all of the entrepreneurial students at UVA. Um, so that people need a an, an <coughs> business person, they need an engineer, they need a chemist. You know, why go hire them somewhere else? We have lots of them here. The E Society is a way for people to interact and connect with one another. Uh, Elizabeth Hubert uh, from Exec Ed, who makes these uh, organizations uh, work. And last but absolutely not least, uh, as many of you know, MJ Toms um, makes everything work here. Or as Letitia said, you're much more organized than I give MJ all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> and she's absolutely right. Um, that's MJ. Just a few words, uh, Mike and I are going to talk a little bit about um, the Batten Endowment. So we're very fortunate to have a rather large endowment from the Batten family. It was given to promote entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, it funds two activities, the entrepreneurship program, which is all of the student-facing activities, the business plan competitions, the incubator, the summer internships. Uh, we support students to go to competitions. We put on VC boot camps. I mean, we really have our incubator. We really have a full complement of activities for students, whether they're dyed-in-the-wool entrepreneurs or thinking maybe a few years out, I'd like to try this. Let me see what it's like for now. Um, and then on the other side, Mike will talk more about it, is the Batten Institute, which is really an academic think tank. And we're, I think, fairly unique at Darden in having both the practical student-oriented activities and the academic research piece, and having the ability to basically take the academic research and translate it. A lot of you have talked about, have heard me talk about effectuation, for example, as a really unique way of talking about entrepreneurship, and that all came out of uh, a faculty member here. So with that introduction, I will turn it over to Mike Lennox, who is head of the Batten Institute. Thank you. 
I, I think Philip said it well about how we kind of have the, the two sides to the shop here. And in many ways, this conference is a, uh, a recognition of those kind of two dual missions that we, we have here at DART and sponsored through the Batten Endowment. So the idea here is to bring people together in a learning environment at some level to learn more about entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and to do so also being informed by research. And, and you see that especially tomorrow when we talk uh, about green tech technology and uh, opportunities in that space. So really this is a collaborative effort where we're kind of joining forces here to bring this uh, to you. <laughs> just, a, just a quick comment on the Batten Institute. As Philip said, we are a research think tank here within Darden uh, around entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, our, our broader aim and mission is kind of a recognition that entrepreneurship and innovation can be a transformative uh, uh, set of mechanisms to advance um, solutions related to pressing social issues. So we're organized around a set of uh, initiatives. Those initiatives concludes work on uh, looking at a organic growth, how firms create value by uh, innovating new products and services. We have an initiative on healthcare and innovation. How do we drive more innovation to our healthcare system? Obviously an important topic right now. We have an initiative on sustainability and innovation. So how do we think about green tech, clean tech innovation? How do we drive entrepreneurship and innovation to address those uh, environmental and sustainability issues we face? And then finally, we have an initiative on uh, entrepreneurship and emerging markets. And we think of that both in terms of developing economies, but also in terms of uh, what my colleague Greg Fairchild calls domestic emerging markets, things like urban renewal, rural development, and the like. And our currency basically is the generation of intellectual capital. We have numerous ways that we push that out, uh, including baton briefings, reports, and then conferences like this as well. Uh, we view it as a, as a central mission to what we do. So let me just uh, uh, you know, thank you all for being here and welcome to this inaugural conference. I think it's going to be an exciting two days here. And uh, enjoy. Thank you. So we're, we're going to go into our, our first panel. And, I, and again, um, the, the issue was, what does it look like if you've been a banker, if you've you know, been an employee somewhere else, you're used to having a regular paycheck, and you decide you're going to be an entrepreneur? Um, our four speakers, uh, Sam uh, Eitzen, uh, Jeff Gardner, were actually classmates. Um, and they'll talk about what they did while they were here. Uh, Andy Krauss, I first met when I came to Darden because he was working at Darden in development. And um, I have some choice words for his <laughs> endeavor. He was going to start a biotech company. That's the world I came from. He had no experience. And I said, not a good idea. But he ignored me, and of course, he was right. <laughs> um, and Stephen uh, Silbiger, who has a very unique business. Uh, no, actually, not unique. That's not a fair statement. Um, but he'll tell you about it. He, uh, he's a very effective promoter and, and marketer of products. But I've asked each one of them to say a few words about how they started their career after Darden and took the leap into entrepreneurship. So, Steve, you want to start? Sure. Do we need to lead it? Uh, no, just tell this mic. Okay. Very good. Uh, I graduated in the recession of 1990, uh, and as a goof, I took an a, uh, interview with a company called Nutrisystem that sold diet programs on television, and that was my first job. Uh, the skills are pretty unique. It's a very small industry that has, which they call TV direct response. Uh, after that, that company went bankrupt. I went to work for the largest infomercial company called National Media, and there I learned how to actually market products on television. Also, direct response TV, very, it's a very limited, very focused type of marketing. And then that company grew very large, again, a lot of bureaucracy, and it was near bankruptcy. And I said, you know, I can't deal with this any longer. I uh, proposed to my angel investors, which have a large catalog company and the infrastructure of a stable business, can I bring a TV marketing business to yours and add that on top of your bureaucracy and your overheads? And if I have huge years, we'll all make money. And if I have bad years, we won't lose any money because I don't have to employ any people short of myself and my assistant. 
And so that's the company I founded back in 1997, and I call it Plymouth Direct. And some of the products that I have, uh, may, have uh, promoted was Mighty Putty, Mighty Mend It, Urine Gone, Strap Perfect, the Smart Mop. These are all products that I found, uh, developed, named, and marked on television. And once they're a success on television, then everybody knows it, and then we blast them through retail, through catalogs, and the internet. And that's what I do. It's a very large business. I have two employees. <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, the challenges are that nobody sets my hours. Uh, you have to be self-motivated. And when I first started the business, you know, the world is your oyster. Uh, and a lot of the things that you would be part of in a small comp in a large company, you had to do yourself. I mean, from faxing to calling to printing to everything. And so you have to be able to do all that at the very beginning. And, but in my business, once you have one hit, all the others are self-funded. So my first product was unsuccessful. Uh, it was unsuccessful as a spot on television. I went to Home Shopping Network. It was called Tan Perfect was very successful. I knew within eight minutes it was all sold out. <laughs> and ever since that, that May of, of 1998, I was self-funding. And that product sold millions. And then I went and did all my other TV products that you'll see at Bed Bath & Beyond, Walmart, <laughs> Kmart, all that stuff. It's been a, a wild ride, I can tell you. It's good. It's fun. Were these products that you invented or that you found in commercialized? I found them. Uh, I, some of the stuff I had were ideas, but I didn't actually invent them. Like Mighty Putty was something that it were that was in the uh, plumber's toolboxes, uh, but never had been promoted. It was actually in you know, a lot of Home Depot and Lowe's, and I teamed it up with Billy Mays, called it Mighty Putty, and you know blasted it as a as a TV product. And it's you know now people know how it works and how you mix it and all that. And before, it was just known as a, a trade thing. Same thing with Mighty Mend It. It was something that was used in the industry uh, to mend fabric. We called it Mighty Mend It, teamed it up with Billy, had some guy jump out of an airplane, and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> this is not something they teach in <clears throat> school. Well, marketing is. I mean, what we do did in Professor Boren's classes put together a marketing plan right. and write scripts and try to find out what's unique about the product. And in my business, it has to be uh, visually demonstrable, it has to right. be unique, it has to have some wow factor. And if it doesn't have that, nobody's going to actually make a phone call in a minute and a half. Right. But when they do, they make a lot of phone calls, but when they don't, you, the customer will know within a week if a product is successful or not. The for those of you who are alums, there's actually now a class of called product innovation, where the students have within the first two weeks to define a product and build it, duct tape, cardboard, whatever it is, um, and then create the marketing plan and actually have a little competition. And things like uh, seat belts for dogs, you know, you get on the brake, your dog doesn't fly out the door, or especially uh, alarm clocks. I mean, it's really a wonderful world of products. Yeah, hi. Um, I took a very long time to become an entrepreneur. I um, uh, started off as an analyst uh, at Goldman Sachs right out of undergraduate school, went back and studied political philosophy and religion, sat around and thought, well, what do I want to do with myself and things that I liked and things that I was passionate about? And I decided that I was going to, to I think to the dismay of my parents, I was going to follow the things that I found really exciting, whether I made any money at it or not. And I spent the next 17 years um, raising uh, funds, capital, for uh, these buildings. So I spent um, 10 years chasing Rick around. I just discovered uh, from Singapore to Hong Kong to New York, um, saw Steve in Philadelphia, knew these guys when they were undergrad or uh, you know MBA students. And um, I came to Darden, spent 10 years here, and about uh, Three years before I left, I started thinking about what is it that I really wanted to do. 
I was turning 40. I knew I always wanted to be an entrepreneur of some sort, but I was very afraid. You know, you work in higher education, you can make a very nice job if you're a vice president at a major university. You've got prestige and honor. I got three kids, and I thought, wow, being an entrepreneur at 40 might be a crazy idea, but uh, I, I decided, well, I'm going to try to figure out what is it that I really want to do. I started saving a lot of cash, which most people don't do and I hadn't done. So I thought if I'm going to do a startup company, I, I wanted to save at least a year's salary. So I started saving as much cash as I could. Uh, I used to show up to every lecture that the Darden School put on and there was this guy who was the, uh, the uh, founder of Red Hook Ale who said, um, were you guys here? Yeah. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. And so he came and he said, uh, you know, always be the best employee, always have a, a business plan in your bottom right hand drawer so that when your boss came by, uh, you could have something you're working on either for the company or for yourself. I thought, well, that's a really sort of an interesting <laughs> concept. And uh, I went to the, the Darden School, sent me through the TEP program. Um, I think you always have to be learning new things, spent, you know, the, the time at the uh, retooling myself, if you will, and started thinking about what is it I wanted to do, the things I really liked. And I was fortunate um, to uh, live in a neighborhood where my neighbor was a doctor uh, at the University of Virginia, and we'd go to the bus stop and we would talk about his research and my research. And I always would like to read all kinds of crazy things and just like to learn all kinds of stuff. And Lloyd came to me one day and said, listen, I'd like to start a co company, commercialize this technology out of the University of Virginia. It is uh, an entirely new way of treating cancer that could potentially change the way all of us um, uh, view the disease in that it would be a maintenance therapy. It would be changing cancer from a deadly disease to a chronic manageable disease. And it, that really seemed to fit my big passion. I wanted to do something good. I think working at the Darden School was a great thing to help people go out and change societies. I thought, wow, a cancer company could be spectacular. We started looking into the intellectual property. I remember the Red Hook guy about writing a business plan. I went to the dean and said I was going to convert my consulting days uh, as a you know as a faculty member to uh, running this little company. The dean said that was fine. I spent 18 months running the company here at the Darden School uh, till I got the intellectual property out and until I got financing from the state of Virginia, which was the first uh, folks to put it in. Um, I built my networks uh, and my first angel investors through a lot of these uh, men and women who I had gotten to know from Darden and at Georgetown, guys from church, any, any, any network to build this company. And we have uh, built a, a very nice uh, company that's on the verge of uh, entering the clinic for brain cancer, a very terrible, uh, deadly disease. And um, it is our hope that we can um, change the way the world views uh, cancer and um, Philip had asked you know what are some of the things the upsides and the downsides how did you weigh what you're going to do and you know so I said you know 40 years old I've got three kids I've got college coming up you know you have prestige if you're in Virginia you're vice president of the University of Virginia you have influence uh, people would like you know help with this that or the other thing you're giving up uh, the hope of becoming the executive vice president, uh, the next step up of the university. Um, a real legitimate fear. Will people return my call because it's Andy Krause calling? Or did people return my calls because I was the vice president of the Darden School? And that was, that was terrifying, actually, because you don't know. If people don't return your phone call, <laughs> you don't have a company. Um, um, I think the exciting things are, you know, and I would encourage everybody to think about is, it's something new to learn. Alex Horneman, Professor Horneman talks about being a learning person. Continue to learn. Uh, I was at a meeting yesterday with a guy who spent 27 years in pharma and at the end of the meeting he said, where did you get your medical training? And I said, I didn't go to medical school, but I've spent so much time learning about this field that it's been extraordinarily exciting. Um, building something. I loved creating things out of nothing. I think we'll probably talk about that. I think helping people with cancer, that's been a huge motivator. It's exciting. Um, um, and I guess on the downside, or you know, I always thought, well, everybody needs a fundraiser. If this fundraising gig, if this cancer company doesn't work, somebody will hire me, and I can go sell something to somebody and make some money. So uh, that's it. Cool. I want to pass over to Sam. He's going to talk a little bit about our experience at Darden. All right. So uh, ten years ago, 
Uh, Jeff and I were probably <laughs> sitting right in this room. I don't exactly remember. And we were uh, listening, we were watching an entrepreneur's panel. And one of the speakers, and we all kind of remember him, but um, we we're trying to remember his name. He said, I'm not the kind of guy that gives advice, but uh, here's what I did. I was, uh, uh, I think he was at Harvard actually, so I was getting my MBA and um, I was trying to fund my own business and I really didn't know if I was going to start it right out of school, but I had this idea and I knew that I needed a fallback. So here's what I did. Man, I needed two things actually, a fallback and I needed some financing. First thing I did was respond to every single credit card solicitation that I could get. So I racked up the ability to assume about $120,000 worth of debt, and that's how I started. And, and you got to remember, this was this was not the current day. I mean, this was back 10 years ago, where ago. you could get debt really easy. So I, I ended up, I actually still have like $200,000 in outstanding credit lines on credit cards because of this guy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that was number one. And then number two, he said, uh, I had, I had a fallback plan in recruiting. So for me to invest myself fully in my business plan, I didn't want to do any on-campus recruiting. I didn't want the temptation to go into consulting or eye banking because it just wasn't my passion. Um, so I didn't do any recruiting, but in the back of my mind, I figured out what would happen. All of my competitive classmates would go and, and get five offers and they would take one of those five offers and then there would be a lot of great companies out there that still had a lot of unfilled spots and I'd have plants in there. I'd have my classmates that were trying to pull me in so I'd call them in the, la in the you know, last week of school <laughs> and they'd pull me in. I'd have the, the easiest interview process possible and get a great job. And I don't remember if that's what, if he ended up going through his fallback plan but somehow, um, and I'm a pretty conservative person, I came into Darden, this is talking about me now, uh, I really wanted to become an entrepreneur, but I was pretty risk averse in a lot of ways. So um, just for me, racking up debt here in business school, I was thinking, you know, I'm definitely going to be that guy that goes out and spends 10 years in consulting, hating it, and then I'll go and, and start my own <laughs> company. Um, something, you know, kind of shifted uh, with me. Um, starting when we heard that presentation. and um, Jeff and I were officers of Entrepreneurs Club at the time, which was in its infancy compared to where you guys are now. And it's, it's, really, it's really exciting, everything that Darden's doing right now. Um, so you know, we, were, we were starting second year with our own business plan. We were both committed to it. Every single second year class had something to do with our venture. We had a, a venture uh, program or project that was part of our class and we had to grease the palms a little bit to get that through. Well, we didn't pay anybody off, but we had to get it <laughs> credit. Um, so we were, we were at a pretty high level of commitment, but I think my conservative nature and learning about where I was risk averse and where I was actually good at embracing risk started when I saw this, you know, multimillionaire stand up and say, this is how I did it and this is where I am today. And, and he was, he was a, a very large success. So I did the same thing. Um, at that point, I decided no recruiting for me, and, and there really wasn't, uh, there, there weren't a lot of opportunities that came on campus that I was interested in. So to me, it was just a distraction from my energy. And even if we decided not to launch this venture, um, I was going to go through a learning process that was very focused and all in. So that's the way I approached it, but I knew that somewhere planted in the back of my mind was that fallback plan. And plus I was acquiring a lot of credit card debt. <laughs> so uh, long story short, uh, we got to the end of the year and Jeff and I had a, a business plan to uh, uh, rent books on tape through vending machines. It's kind of a uh, uh, it seemed like about a 1970s idea, and this was uh, 1999. <laughs> um, but we went into the uh, business plan competition. We won the competition, which was $1,500 at the time. And uh, we, got, we got a little bit of interest from uh, one of the panelists there who was a VC. And you know, we, were, we were starting to, to really move down the line. And 
about six weeks before graduation, uh, we pretty much disproved the financial model. So Jeff will tell you his story. He, <laughs> he didn't do the fallback back plan that I had. He actually had a fallback plan, which he'll tell you about. Uh, he did the smart thing of actually getting a job. Um, I looked at six weeks down, you know, from graduation and said, oh crap. Uh, I had uh, my parents coming out and my dad and I were heading on a fishing trip to the Bahamas and that was deadline. Something was going to happen before then because I was not going to, I was not going to skip that trip. So um, exactly what happened to, uh, within the, the entrepreneur's fallback plan just worked out perfectly for me. I made some phone calls and within a couple of weeks I had uh, two good offers um, that, that could have actually moved me towards my goals. Uh, and then I got the third one through the alumni network. And it was just huge. Not only did I get the opportunity through an alum, but an alum who was placed in the same job years before said, you know, I just in the phone conversation with you, I know that you're probably going to want something a, a little bit more fast paced than this. So um, what I would recommend is the company I'm in now, which is it was a company called IXL, uh, also started by a Darden grad, Bert Ellis. Um, and by the way, they have a Denver office because I told him this other opportunity was in Virginia and I told him that I really want to get back out west. I'm from the west. I would love to be in the Rocky Mountains, but that's real pie in the sky. Ended up getting uh, a job at uh, IXL, which is an internet services company um, in Denver. It was you know, perfect from uh, a lot of standpoints. And uh, that's where my, you know, post Darden career started. It lasted a year and a half. So this is 1999, um, just about the height of the internet bubble. And it was just an amazing experience to be climbing really high. The day that I went out to interview was the day they went public, so I missed that. And every interview was about that short and everybody was staring at their computer screens. <laughs> That's probably how I got the job. I said, who's the Sam Eitzen guy? Well, you interviewed him. So uh, went out there and it just skyrocketed and then it plummeted so quickly that myself and a colleague a year and a half later were able to split off and actually take advantage of a really poor economy to bootstrap and we started it's an internet services company as well but very much focused on the marketing end so um, the, the initial form is basically what it is today interactive marketing with a focus on sales lead generation and search engine marketing um, but then it was you know we were we were one of the pioneers we were one of the smaller pioneers but uh, we were kind of defining it as we went we spent one solid year working out of my townhouse, just the two of us, and that's when we finally hired our first employee. So very slow, um, all bootstrapped, and we, we never put a dime into it. When I met with our accountant to do taxes, he said, you know, at some point you're going to want to sell this thing, you're going to want a valuation, so what's your basis? What have you put into the company? And I said, uh, probably five bucks if I really stretched it and I gave you all my receipts. <laughs> he said, let's call it 15,000 so at least you have a little bit of basis in it. Um, and that's, it's always been like that. Um, now, I love to say that we're a big company with two employees. We're a small company with 35 employees. Um, and along the way, I, you know, I think a lot of uh, what has, what has kind of kept us going through the risk is, um, just the, the trade-off we've made by not taking any funding, by keeping it all to ourselves, closely held, and being able to make our own decisions go as slow or as fast as, as we were capable of, of going. So uh, Sam told a little bit about the, the business venture that we started putting together while we were in school. Uh, it was actually a company, we named it Yodel, we had designed the machine, it was, think of Redbox today. It was the same sort of thing, except we were really big on books on tapes. I was doing a lot of traveling, a lot of commuting, and uh, I was listening to these books on tapes, loved them. So the idea was, let's make this available to, uh, to people who are commuting to work. So you know, we built everything, we designed the machine, and we were ready to go. Uh, and you know, we were going through the economics, and you know, the big issue was at the time, this is, I mean, this is 10 years ago, this is before iTunes and micropayments. 
Uh, and the big thing is these things weren't really expensive, and every time you swiped a credit card to pay for it, there was a big per transaction charge to Visa MasterCard we're charging. And we, we just, you know, part of it is, so I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. So on that side, you know, we're looking at the, uh, the business model and what's going on. Uh, and then on the other side, I, I'm a very competitive person. And to be shaking your head, <laughs> and, and you know, I'm looking at all my, my classmates neck. getting these $100,000 job offers, and I'm thinking, you know, I should at least, you know, see what's out there, right? So, you know, I'm looking at, you know, both of these things going on, evaluating the business plan, and, you know, really wanted to do that, but at the same time, you know, I'm sitting on all this debt as well, and, you know, I'm a little bit scared to go out and do this thing. So, you know, weighing both of those things, and uh, to be completely authentic with myself, you know, I think we looked at the visa thing, we saw it as a major hurdle, and said, you know, we can't do this. You know, let's go, uh, let's go take a real job for a while, and then, uh, and then we'll go do what we want to do. So, uh, there's my moment of authenticity to tell you what was really going on uh, inside my mind. Uh, so I went out to, uh, to, to Denver, also wanted to be in the Denver area. Uh, moved out there, started with this huge, massive company called US West, a telecom company uh, that was bought by Quest about six months after uh, I, I moved out there. And I got to tell you, it was an absolute disaster. I mean, for me, it was bureaucracy hell. Uh, it, it was just, it, it was a disaster. It just did not fit from a cultural standpoint at all. Um, however, I got to learn my negotiation skills really well. So there were 18 of us that started in this program that was an executive development program. So you go, you rotate from job to job in different departments. And it was a US West stamp program. And then we came out there, Quest bought the company, and they got rid of the program and said, all oh, you guys, you, know, you, you land in the job where you are. Uh, and I managed to get into the executive office and say, hey, listen, all, you know, all 18 of us signed up for this rotational program, and it's no longer there, so you know, we should be eligible for a severance package. Uh, and at the time, there was, uh, they were paying severance based on how much money you made, not on how long you'd been with the company. Uh, so negotiated just a wonderful severance package. Uh, took that opportunity, went over to a startup called Qubit Technology, making these wireless web tablets. Uh, and this was, you know, uh, six months, early 2000. Uh, and it was it, just a terrible business model, all based on the internet, uh, and the thing just absolutely crashed. Uh, I went over there as a head of marketing, completely unqualified to do the job. Uh, it was wonderful, great experience, uh, but we ended up shutting it down. Uh, you know, at the time, I was so proud of the money that was behind it. It was Tyco Ventures, and, you know, which was <laughs> such a good name at the time. Uh, and, and it was Chase Capital, which is uh, still a relatively good name. And uh, th that didn't work, and uh, I actually, I did an Ironman during when I, when I lost the job there because I still had a little bit of severance. Uh, and my wife's like, you got to get your ass back to work. Uh, you just, you, you got to go to work. Uh, so I went with this company called Avaya, uh, another telecom company, a little different situation. You know, they were trying to turn this thing into more of a faster moving company, but still just an absolute, the, the history was very, very slow moving. Uh, so went over there really just to get a paycheck. Uh, and ended up working for, I'm an ex-GE guy, pre-Darden, uh, ended up working for a GE guy there who's a turnaround guy as well, and we just hit it off. So I ended up taking six different jobs there in about five years, and you know, the job that I loved the most was I was asked to find out where our new revenue was going to come from. And so we started this incubator group, and I started two businesses and took two underperforming businesses that they had and just sort of ran this portfolio of companies. Uh, did extremely well. I think it, you know, in 13 or 14 months, we grew it from like a $30 million annual business to like 105 million. And so as punishment, they asked me to run the overall maintenance organization for, uh, for, for Avaya on a worldwide basis. So immediately go from that to having 3,500 union uh, employees, uh, which was, you know, I was back in hell again. It was, uh, it was bureaucratic. Uh, it, it just it didn't fit me and who I am and, and, and what I was about. Uh, and at the same time, uh, they asked me, you know, headquarters was up in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. I'm out in beautiful uh, Denver, Colorado. And uh, they asked me to, you know, start moving to headquarters because that was where the, the path was headed. Uh, and I was sitting, it's, it's funny how the story came together. I was uh, in our neighborhood, we had a Memorial Day party and uh, we were without a union contract. Uh, it, is, uh, it expired the night before. Uh, I've got 800 replacement non-union technicians ready to go, uh, and I'm on the phone with my negotiation team in Washington, D.C. Uh, they're literally in the park. They got a, a keg of beer tapped. 
everybody's drinking and throwing football and I'm on the cell phone until my cell phone runs out and then I borrow somebody else's cell phone and somebody else's. And at the end of the night, I finally get off and I was like, you know, this is so unrewarding. I mean, it's, the company was so good to me. I mean, they treated me so well. But the job for me was just so unrewarding. Uh, and the guy that I was talking to this was actually lived about, you know, half a block down from me. And he goes, he's a serial entrepreneur. And he goes, you know, I got this thing uh, called PaySimple. And it's, uh, it's just me and, you know, three other guys. But I really think it's, it's got some legs to it. And uh, so we just started talking. And then I had a conference downtown Denver. Uh, went over to his office, you know, literally, I mean, it was like 400 square feet, bright red paint, uh, two sofas that, uh, I mean, they looked like they were 60 years old. Uh, they were scary to sit on, to be honest with you. And, you know, we just started whiteboarding uh, what this business could be and what it could look like. Uh, and at the time, it was really just sales and sell marketing. They were selling, so, so what Pay Simple is, is they provide automated, uh, it's a piece of software, uh, on-demand software that allows small businesses to collect their payments. Uh, so, for example, you're, I mean, anything from a daycare center, you know, a typical daycare center, you know, you get, uh, you send invoices home with the, with the kids and then you're supposed to give a check back to them. So it automates that whole process. You leave a credit card number, an ACH number, and it just drafts automatically. So it allows a daycare center owner to do what they should be doing, taking care of kids, instead of trying to worry about collecting money. To hosting companies, to all offices, all, all kind of different, uh, different businesses. But he said, you know, it's, at the time we were reselling somebody else's product. And I said, you know, to really make this something, we need to own the technology. And if you're serious about owning the technology, you know, I, I'll come over and we, we can do this. So, you know, over the summer, you know, we worked together uh, for three or four months, sort of seeing if we could work together. And I decided, uh, what the hell, uh, let, 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 let's go ahead and do it. Um, and it was scary. You know, is it some of those same fears that I had coming out of Darden uh, came out as well, which is, Oh God, you know, is it, you know, I'm under this corporate umbrella. I'm doing really, really well. Uh, you know, it, it, it feels safe. You know, I, I got all this money. I got three kids, uh, a wife who's not working, who's enjoying her time off. And, you know, do I really want to give up that for this? Um, but at the same time, I also knew that, you know, I was getting to the point from a lifestyle standpoint that it was going to be really hard to step out of it uh, in the future. So it was, you know, a lot of, I mean, those three or four months where I was trying to figure this out, uh, it was tormenting. I mean, it was, it was really, really tough for me. Um, but ultimately came down to being, you know, true to myself and what I wanted and said, you know, what the hell, you know, let's go ahead and do it. Um, so I go over there, uh, join PaySimple, uh, and, you know, the company has done uh, extremely well. And we can get into some of the stories when we, when we open up for the discussions. Um, but me is my problem is that I have uh, I need to be really really busy and uh, pay simple is at the point where it has been running uh, so well and we've got such a good team uh, built out now uh, that I actually uh, just left I'm still on the board but just left uh, for a private equity turnaround uh, just started Monday with these guys uh, so I'm in a little bit of a different uh, model you know beginning this week so. That's my history. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, based on, on, on Jeff and Andy, talk to your neighbors. <laughs> yep. Don't be asocial. Um, in hindsight, would you do it differently now? I mean, you all sort of went off to do other things. You sort of played with being entrepreneurial while you were here. Given what you know now, what would you say to these students? Forget about the job. Go start your business now. Well, I wouldn't, um, I, but I had a, a pretty short period of time between graduating and then actually jumping into my venture um, just because of how the cards stacked up. But I think that's part of it. I, um, I, I didn't go into any of my history before Darden, but I had a couple of experiences previously, previously with trying to define exactly where I wanted to go and go out and grab it and go out and do something on my own, complete failures. Um, and even you know, one was a complete success. I got exactly where I wanted to go and figured out this is not at all where I want to be. So I got very disillusioned with that path and just instead figured out, well, this feels right. And this is the experience that I know I'm going to need to get in order to develop something. And I just don't know what that something is. So that's really the philosophy that 
uh, won out for me probably because I just wasn't a good enough self-leader to do it the other way. And you know, because of that uh, and, and letting it come a little bit more, I ended up getting the job, but the job worked. And I ended up in a very short period of time making the right contacts and hitting the right uh, environment to start something probably the way that I was inclined to start it anyway, instead of going after VC funding and, and um, that whole route, bootstrapping. I think it begins with the idea. How good is the idea? How actionable is the idea? So I don't think the economy has anything to do with it. It's like publishing a book or putting something on TV that I do. You know, If it's a great idea, it, the time is right. But if it's a mediocre idea or it, one of the some of those horrible ideas that came out of the dot coms and anything was a good idea then that probably wouldn't be the time to do it now because people aren't throwing money at you so i think it just begins so, with so uh, how do you know if it's a good idea well you know you don't, you know your conviction would tell you if it's a good idea i mean you've te like some of your things you hit you should have tested it with some of your friends uh all your business contacts and all that type of thing to to see if it's a real idea or not, as opposed to something in the incubator at Darden. Maybe you would have found out that that payment problem was a real problem. Yeah, so I guess, did you want to go? No, I can go later. So uh, my advice would be, you know, it, it depends. Uh, if you are a, if you have sales experience, just go do it, honestly. If you are a guy like me who uh, I mean, I was a finance analytical, I mean, that, my, that was my background. I was never out in front of the customer. Uh, go get a sales job and get that experience because the one theme you'll see among all of us is we sell. And if you can't sell, you should not be an entrepreneur, period. I mean, from, I mean, every aspect of the job is about selling. It is from uh, raising capital. So I mean, a little bit about, you know, pay simple. When, when uh, my partner and I first sat down, uh, we thought, you know, we raise a million dollars from friends and family, a million dollars, and then we'll be good to go. Um, we burned through that million dollars in about seven months. Uh, then we went out and we raised uh, five million dollars from friends and family and a couple, you know, small institutional investors. Uh, and then uh, we went out and we raised six million dollars, and that's all selling. And then I'll remember it's a, so our, our our largest customer and you know the thing that's you know PaySimple's about to have major breakthrough right now. Um, we have uh, we built a product with American Express uh, and selling to American Express. Uh, think about it. I mean we're PaySimple. We are you know 42 guys in this small office in Denver, and literally I mean here, here's what happened. We we had American Express coming in. We are. Uh, in, I think we had 42 people in 3,000 square feet. I had, I had three other people in my office. We were uh, desk to desk to desk. And, you know, we didn't have room to, for all these American Express. They came in with 12 people. And, uh, you know, I was like, what the hell do we do? So we knew we had to get new space. We were looking at space. You know, part of our deal with, uh, with the landlord was, you gotta let us have this conference room before we signed the lease. And uh, so we, it was two blocks down. We didn't have any internet or any wiring, so we actually put a satellite dish, or our tech guy put a satellite dish on the building, went up on the roof. I mean, this is midnight the night before. So we're streaming our technology. We put a satellite dish on, the, on our existing building and, and had line of sight uh, for the internet so we, could, so we could do our product demos. And uh, I mean, think about that. I mean, that is selling under the gun. Uh, we knew we had one shot and, and, and Amex was the one. They had six million small business customers that we were targeting. And you know, this is, we just had to hit it. Um, and fortunately we did, but it's all about selling. So for me, I'd say, go learn that on somebody else's nickel if you're not comfortable doing it right now. I, I agree, this, being an entrepreneur is all about selling. Uh, for, I think it does depend on, on your personality. Um, for me, I think, you know, Philip's idea, this is an insane idea. Why are you starting a life sciences company? It's gonna fail. And um, I think building a context of uh, and a resume of things that you've done, things that you've achieved, contacts that you have, have played out extraordinarily well for me. You know, I, I couldn't have done this right out of school. I wouldn't have had the self-confidence to do what you guys did. I just, that just wasn't me. But you know, now people look and they say, I want to be an investor, and they look at all the things that we've put together, all the things that I've done, and they say, all right, I'm willing to bet that 
because there's a lot of great products. And what you learn is is that you're you're voting or you're betting on a management team, the ability to get stuff done. Does this gal? Does this guy? have the ability to move the ball and make stuff happen. And you know, for me, I think building 17 years worth of experiences, learning how to sell all these things, was very instrumental for me. So you don't regret having not started earlier? No, I, I'm sure I would have crashed and burned through everybody's money. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't. I, I do. You do regret I, I regret, yeah. I, I, I didn't start soon enough. Questions? No. Part of that, though, is also not just who you are, but where you are in your family. I mean, uh, so for instance, when I graduated in 82, we had a uh, Professor Johnson who ran an entrepreneur course who told us that if you didn't become an entrepreneur in your first two years leaving Dart, you probably wouldn't become one. Um, and it took me almost 20 years before I became one, sort of like Andy. You know, there's sometimes there's, you know, and, and, and frankly, you either do it right away or before you buy a house, in other words, before you become really indebted, um, or you do it after you pay off the house, so to speak, but you don't want to be carrying a lot of debt. So it's also where you are in your life, so to speak, where you're comfortable taking that risk. And sometimes it's sort of like being an expat, too. You either do it when the kids are young or after the kids are out of school. And, uh, but it's a timing of where you are in your life, uh, as well as the confidence issues that they talk to. Follow on that. How do each of your families uh, think about what you're doing for a living? Do they like it or not? Sarah, that's my daughter. How do you feel about what I do? How do they think we're doing the spot? Here we go. You always bring home fun products. To <laughs> <laughs> I remember naming Gary God at the dinner table one night. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's never a dull moment in our house. <laughs> yes, but have you ever had your allowance cut off for six months while everybody was working through the financials of a new company? <laughs> no, I was really lucky. My right out of Darden, uh, I don't golf. But I write books, and the first thing I did was write the 10-day MBA, which put together all that we learned here in this school. Cliff noted it. Is it less than Darden? Yeah, it's, well, it's now it's 1695. But you wrote that? Yeah, and so that you know, although I had my real job, I was getting these royalties in, which when I had to make that leap as my company was the company I was working for I saw going bankrupt I had a bunch of royalties to, to cushion if boy if something really went bad you know I'd have a couple of years or more to to look for another job so I'm really conservative financially so I wouldn't have risked the boat for uh, for the idea this is gonna be on YouTube you said <laughs> Anna honey I love you <laughs> but uh, she, it, it, it was tough. I mean, she was scared as hell. I mean, I was scared, but she was really scared. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, I think, the hardest part of making the decision was she wasn't quite there. Uh, but, but she got there. And once she got there, she was committed to it. And she said, we're going to make this happen. Because she, she was not working. Um, you know, and she was, it was, she was starting to get really comfortable. We had three small kids. Uh, my daughter was just born. And then I had a three-year-old and a, and a five-year-old at the time. So really, uh, yeah, really risk averse, right? Um, so, w but we decided to go ahead and do it. You know, she was playing a lot of tennis. She was enjoying life. I mean, having a good time. And uh, it, like six months after it started, so I, we put some money away. Um, but my wife is is very very conservative by nature. And uh, about six months after I started, uh, I took about to just put it in perspective, probably about a seventy percent pay cut for what I was making before. Uh, and granted, I wasn't. I wasn't in the poor house because we raised some capital, so you know it, it was it was it was manageable, um, but it was it, it was a significant uh, change. And then about six months in, uh, we have a bunch of rental properties uh, that I picked up. Had this great idea that I'd buy real estate in Florida, <laughs> and I'd be able to retire on it. Uh, so we uh, we did that, and it's like every property it was just bam 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 uh, lost tenants, and it was like what the hell just happened. And uh, so she decided on her own, we were, I remember we were talking uh, on, on a Monday night, and she's like, you know, I probably should go back to work. Uh, and that was the end of the conversation. We talked about it for like two minutes. I was like, not yet. You don't need to. And by Thursday, she had two job offers. 
Uh, so I was like, all right, that works. And, uh, and, and you know, she's been working since. Um, so, and it was, you know, what we had to do. And then when it came time for this next change, uh, she's just like, she's do, just like do it. Uh, it was uh, over it. I could, uh, we could do anything now, I think, and she would be 100% supportive of it. And the kids, I mean, the, the, the business becomes your life. So, you know, even on vacations, you know, you got the Blackberry thing and you, you know, you, you got the computer with you, you know, you're always, it, it becomes your life. Uh, but the kids see it that way. It's not like it's, it changes from work to sort of who you are. So, you know, it felt like when I was working for a corporation, you know, when I had to do that kind of stuff on vacation, I was really annoyed by it. Uh, I hated it and it felt like, you know, I, I had to go to work and it was such a burden versus now it's just, it's fun. I mean, all, all of this is just, it's just fun. I think part of it is for me, it may just be a mindset thing, but when you start talking about equity and what it creates for you, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just a different mindset. Uh, and then the other thing is says, because we've got a bunch of different experiences up here. So there's, you know, there's two ways of, of going after this if you want to be an entrepreneur. Uh, you can raise a lot of money uh, and, you know, from a salary standpoint, again, I, I was still making six figures. Uh, it was still, you know, comfortable going into an entrepreneur type situation. Uh, but, you, you know, you're giving up equity when you're raising capital. Um, so, you know, that's the drawback. So I've got good friends now. And the thing is, when you start hanging out in the circle with entrepreneurs, you'll find out that, I mean, the people are just fun. Uh, honestly, they're just, they have a different view on life. And, uh, you know, it's like anything is possible is, 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 is what I find out hanging, hanging out with, the, with these kind of folks. And it's just, so you can go after it, raise a lot of capital, uh, you know, try and do it fast, or you can take a longer, you know, a 10, 12, 15 year approach uh, to building a business, building a business much longer term uh, and, and going that route and, more, you know, you're taking a bigger hit financially probably uh, as you're building and growing that business. Uh, but two different approaches, uh, you know, you may get there the same way in the end, but I can tell you right now, I own less than 10% of PaySimple. Uh, I mean, I'm the third largest shareholder behind American Express and my partner. Um, if we had done it ourselves, we would have done things very differently. We would have bootstrapped it. We would have taken it, it would have taken a lot longer uh, to, to get where we are right now. Um, but I don't know a hell of a lot more of the company. So it's, you, you got to weigh the, the opportunities. I have, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I, two stories I'd actually like to share about that point. Uh, first point is, um, you know, we talk a lot about your decision to start a business and when you go about that and with what experience, but I think no matter how you go about it and whether you bootstrap it or you're funded, you're not just making that decision. You make a decision every single day and that all of those decisions have risk attached to it. Myself and my business partner were both kind of conservative, so we had this idea that we'd get past the hard part and then it'd be pretty smooth sailing. Well, that has never, ever been the case. And <laughs> you always have to double down, or, or you, have to, you always have to make the conscious decision of doubling down or passing on the opportunity and growing slower or getting eaten by your competitors. So the importance of, uh, of your spouse um, your, your children all being involved, it, it can't be stated enough because it's not that one-time thing of, okay, honey, I'm going to, and by the way, Michelle, I love you too, <laughs> and I love Anna too. Uh, you know, you don't just ask for their support once. You ask for their support every single day, and you, you understand them, and they understand you, but you also understand that if they're not in it, they can't fully understand what you're going through, and you'll have days where you come home and it's all over your face what has happened at work. You don't get that that's all over your face. And you have some tough conversations about that, that somehow you have to uh, communicate without that full depth of experience sharing. Um, I think that the second point is um, the, the family situation and just all of your, your financial obligations that you're deep into and you can't get out of are really great growth motivators for the business. So when I started, I mean, I started, I didn't have that much risk. I felt like it was a lot of risk. You know, I was passing uh, on a, a very good offer um, uh, and both my business partner and I had this come to Jesus moment of both of us had great offers. We were going into what we knew was a really poor economy. 
but our hearts were more in where we were focused. So we got over that hump, and at the same time, my risk was I had a new mortgage on a very small townhouse, and I had a dog. Uh, his risk was he was just getting married and um, had a, a bigger mortgage coming up very soon, and his wife was already starting to talk about law school. Um, so, so, you know, it was really his side of the business that made us dig in a little bit harder. And when it was the three of us, uh, myself and him and my dog, and we were in a room <laughs> small enough that we could each, we could tap each other on the shoulder and run a business plan by the dog. Uh, we were, you know, we were always at that point of, okay, am I going to get a midnight job uh, at Starbucks? Um, no, they're not open at midnight. Uh, or, you know, are we going to pass on this thing? And what really made us grind it out was knowing what we were trying to build for his family and for whatever I was going to become. Um, so it was good. And every time something like that would happen in our family, so I was getting married, we were having children, uh, um, the, the tree fell, fell on the house. Every time we just look at each other and say, okay, time to raise the projections, let's go out and sell some business. And every single time it's worked so far. Uh, once you're established, things are a lot easier. What about that uh, that first time you're trying to convince that first customer to you know take your product or you know raise your first piece of capital and trying to get the business going? You know, can you, can you talk about that? I was very fortunate that I had just built some great relationships with some friends and. Uh, um, I think spending the time with people and helping them have you think through we actually drew up the original business plan at the nook on the back of a uh, you know a white uh, you know placemat and uh, the guys uh, you know just basically just volunteered and said listen I'll put in 25 I'll put in 25 I'll commit Jonathan to 50 and he wasn't there and another guy and you know that was the first you know first hundred thousand dollars which I think for any company that first hundred thousand bucks is it's 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 huge and uh, so that, that, was, that, that was us having just some friends uh, who were willing to believe and help you think things through. And uh, most of the original um, folks that helped funded us were all part of that same sort of thinking through, became advisors, and put up you know, the, the first really big money. My business is pretty self-funding once you get a success. So it's a matter of putting the initial capital and selling the first product. My first product was called Tan Perfect. And I was at a... Uh, a women's expo fair of products and one of the booths had somebody selling self tanner but it had a color in it and so they would put it on you and put it on one arm and then after that sent, while they're pitching you and they're holding you in in their clutches as they're demonstrating it on your arm and then as the before and after they put your other arm against it and I'm watching this for like a half hour as these <laughs> ladies, old, young, go, are going by, and they're charging them 40 bucks a piece. I go, wow, that's 40 bucks for a self tanner. It has a before and after, and to me that and it had an obvious benefit for people. And I knew straight away that would be my first product. So when I proposed it to my angel investor, they said, you know, self tanning hasn't really been a good product in the catalog. But I don't want to limit your creativity, and you probably know more about TV than I do, so go ahead and do it. And in my business, the cost of doing a commercial and putting some initial inventory together and media, you know, it's about $100,000 a pop. And so it's not a huge downside, but that was the pitch. It's the pitch I just gave you right now. <laughs> that was it. I said, yeah, let's do it. And that was the first product. specifically more for the, the uh, more tech type startups. So, where do you guys find talent that you can for work that you can't do? Right. So, how do you find like great talent for work that you can't do? So, it's like finding a programmer or finding an engineer. Because as a startup, all you have to offer really is equity, right? You don't have too much money to pay. Them. Yep. So, uh, I, I tell you, from my perspective, so we built a software product, and we screwed it up bad. I mean, we screwed it up really bad. We. Uh, I mentioned we started selling somebody else's product and we rebranded as our own and we said, you know, in order to own the customer, we've got to have our own technology. 
Uh, so we met through our circles in the financial industry, uh, met this group uh, that specializes of the, in development in India. Um, so we spec'd it out, you know, wrote 100 pages of, you know, here's exactly what we wanted to do from a functionality standpoint. Um, but we were, we've made the mistake of not hiring our CTO, right? I mean, hiring that chief technical person and getting them in there to oversee the development. So we relied on them uh, to do everything. And huge, huge learning. I mean, we just, we lost a million bucks on it. Uh, it's just, it, it, so, but we brought it back. And then we had something to show. So I, I wouldn't say we lost it all because it got us in the door to start showing it. Um, but as soon as we hired our CTO, uh, we brought her on board. She was amazing. And you know, we just started building out our own internal team. And you pay a little bit more for it, but the productivity is so much better that uh, you know, in six months, we had the, the next version of the product built. Uh, and it was, it was fantastic. Um, so, and, it, and it wasn't a knock on India development because I've done it before and it works well but you gotta have the right oversight to it, and, and we didn't. So um, I would recommend if you're developing tech from a startup standpoint, do it here where you got a close eye on it, uh, and then you, know, you start pick the tasks if you wanna outsource that. But owning the technology is, is key. I would say check your networks. Uh, we have to hire technical people. It's amazing you put the word out, give yourself some time. Yeah. You will find, and you do not wanna hire anybody that you don't know, that doesn't know that person because you can be hosed. Uh, mm -hmm. There's lots of people who have all the right pedigrees, but you need somebody who can get it done. Yeah, our CTO came from a competitor in a prior industry that we were in, so. Related to that, how much have you relied on your garden network? Very heavily. Um, I mean, mine from the, even from the standpoint of getting that first job that led to my business, um, I'm not, you know, naturally great at reaching out to networks. So um, that was that was really my first time at just calling somebody out of the blue just because they were a Darden grad, and it worked so well that I just kept doing it. Uh, and every single time, you you take what should have been a cold call, and it's immediately warm. And you know, they fellow grads have that trust level with you, and I think especially at, at this school. And you know, the honor code has something to do with it. So you, you automatically know a little bit about what kind of a person you're talking to, and you just, and I've been on the phone with more recent Darden grads too, you just have this thing where you, you love the story, you wanna help, you're, you're in. Um, and especially to you know, some, of, uh, some of these entrepreneurs who have been at it for 10, 20, 30 years, and uh, maybe their you know businesses have, have turned into something that's a little less entrepreneurial. They want to be involved again, so they're more likely than anyone to help you out. Yeah, my comment on Dart Network is uh, there's been select few that I have tapped uh, in classmates that I've talked to, so it's been helpful from that standpoint. Uh, but I would say to you guys, move out west. I guarantee you, it's sunny in Denver today. <laughs> uh, it is, honestly, it's been hard. I tried last year to get some talent from Darden to come out uh, and work at PaySimple, and uh, it just, the location just didn't work for, uh, for the folks I was talking to. So I would love to see more folks spread, because regionally we're so strong here, um, but you, when you start getting out west, you, honestly, we lose a little bit of that brand equity. Because you're not in Boulder. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, Andy had mentioned that, you know, one of the motivations for you was to do something that was meaningful to you. Broadly speaking, for everybody on the panel, how much of your drive is to be an entrepreneur versus specifically what your business is now? Um, can you speak to that? You I can. I, uh, my, my entrepreneurial drive is uh, much stronger than it ever was. And it's actually a frustration for me because, as I mentioned, our uh, our company has kind of steadily grown. Um, we still, you know, have not taken any outside funding, so it's great, and we we can be entrepreneurs within our companies, within our company, uh, and we're more innovative than when we started. So all that is great, but now I'm finding that I have a lot more ADD, and I want to do so many different things, and it's always that push and pull of, well, how. How actively do you have to manage this, and how you know when you know you can branch out into something else without giving this up? Um, this year has been uh, uh, actually really good for that. We've we've 
taken advantage of the uh, the economy to pull in some very senior talent and replace most of what myself and my business partner do so that we can pursue some new revenue models. Um, but it's uh, it's been a, a growth process for me because it, at first it, it was just, it, I mean at first, for the first five or six years, it was enough just to focus on what we were doing and continually build it. Yeah. So if I can actually just uh, kind of clarify, I, I guess, um, Jeff, you, you kind of mentioned that, you know, this, the bureaucracy is kind of what you didn't want to be a part of, you know, it's like, I can't do this. And, and you had talked about the books on tape before. I mean, if, if, you, if you weren't doing the, the pay simple and you wound up doing the, the books on tape, I mean, I, I guess I'm asking, is that motivation, is that entrepreneurial drive and spirit? the same had it been the books on tape or versus what you're doing now? Yeah, the, the, the idea of the business, honestly, it, do, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. It's, it's the challenge and honestly, I have, it's funny because when I was working for corporations, you know, up until, you know, four years ago, for me, I couldn't come up with an idea to start a business to save my life. I mean, it was, it was like, you know, how do people come up with these ideas? And now after being in an environment the last four years, it's like, God, I got so many ideas. It's like, what do I do next? And it's just like, it's almost like you've got to submerge yourself in that environment in order to get it. Uh, so it's, I, I could, I mean, I'll do another 10 or 15 businesses before I retire, uh, if I ever retire. It's just, it's fun and it's the, it's the idea, it's not the, it's not the business for me. I would love to have a great cause that I'd say I'm passionate about, but I'm passionate about making businesses. I, my business is like uh, queen coins in a slot machine. And to see it hit is really pretty cool. <laughs> so, for instance, if it would be like you're in Gone or Mighty Mendit, you go through all this development in, in my company, you name it, you, know, you try it out, you let Sarah use it, show it to people, then we produce a commercial, uh, we get our media plan out, and then that weekend, we pretty much know if it's a success or not. And if it's a success, you know, just you know, you'll see it dozens and dozens of times. They'll make fun of it on YouTube. Uh, and then eventually you'll see it at Walmart and at Bed Bath & Beyond or wherever. And it's kind of like, wow, you know, your judgment on that product was right. And my company's not a large one, so I only choose maybe four or five a year to do. So I'm pr pretty selective. So it's always a charge to see if something worked or not. But his feedback takes three days. Mine took three years. So yeah, it's, mine's a big <laughs> yeah. Can we do a, a TV spot, a spot? Can you hold up the 10-day MBA? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Do these things zoom? Any first year that hasn't gotten this book, get that book. 10-day yeah. MBA. They recommend it now. Do they? Yes. Yeah, it's like Cliff Notes. It's like what they actually taught you. And so you know, people use it you know, to crib for tests or do they want to go to business school at all? So it's been good. So one comment you made I thought was really interesting. It's not, at some point it stops being work, it's who you are. So was that who you always were? Because with the way you were describing it, it almost sounded like once you got into it, it was like, oh yeah, this is what I should be doing. But you couldn't know that before. You no, know, I, I think it was always there. Uh, but I think there was that just level of fear that, you, you know, and it's so funny because I look back on it now and I was scared to leave the security of a corporate job. I mean, think about how ridiculous that sounds, <laughs> right? Leave the security of a corporate job. I mean, once from the moment I left, uh, I mean, six months out, I felt so much secure. I controlled my own destiny as opposed to, you know, I mean, I rocked the boat, boat in my corporate career so much, and I happened to have somebody who was a great supporter of me and who helped move me along. If I would have had somebody different, I would have could have very easily been fired. I mean, just we got to get rid of this guy. So, and if that gentleman would have left and somebody else would have been put in there, you know, I, honestly, I could have lost my job. Um, so it's just the irony of it is just to me in hindsight, I look at it and it's just it, it, it's silly. Um, so I think it was always there. I just had to get over the fear of letting go of, uh, of, of the corporate income and, the, and the, the corporate environment. I used to consider myself an entrepreneur at the Darden School, sort of an in-house entrepreneur, and, and I would drive people nuts also. Um, and I do feel like you, I've come alive running this company. I work a lot harder, but I work when I want to work, or if I want to go out and do something, I can do it, or I can stay up all night. Yeah. It, it's nice. 
And it's, I mean, it literally becomes part of you and your family. So, I mean, the kids, they come into my office. I mean, I got a television in my office, and the kids will sit there at the table, and, you know, they'll watch TV, and, I mean, it's just, and then we'll go to a ball game after work, and it just, it just sort of all blends together, as opposed to you got a work life, and then you go home, and you got a family life. It's just, it, it's not that way. Jefferson was famous um, for his epitaph. You know, if, if you go up to Monticello and you look on his tombstone, you read three or four things that he wanted to be remembered by, and they wouldn't be you know, the top of mind things. You think, oh, President, if I, you know, start checking some of those things off. I'm interested to hear now if you guys get to that point, you look back, what are the, what would your epitaph say that you were most proud of, of accomplishing? And how is that interwoven with entrepreneurship? So before you answer that, I, it, that's an interesting point. So I often say to students, write your obituary. Yeah. Because it's over, right? You're dead. It's not, well, I'll do it eventually, or maybe I'll get to it. And then think really hard about what it is that you want to have people say about your life beyond, you know, you're a good dad and you're a generous person. And what really matters. And, and I think that's a really interesting exercise to keep in the back of your head. So I'm curious to know what you would think. I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking here, but I'll talk some more. <laughs> uh, so, so for me, uh, honestly, it, it has nothing to do with the business itself. So for me, it is, you know, I hate to use the cliche, but it's, it's about my family life, to be honest with you. I mean, that is, without a doubt, the most focal point in my life is my family. Uh, you know, three kids, love every free moment I have, I spend with them. And half the time they come to work with me and we do those kind of things. So that is core to who I am. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, I always say that, you know, I create a platform that, to help people shine. And it's, you know, it's talent that comes, uh, you know, I want to get the best out of everybody. So it's not, you know, taking, uh, you know, somebody who could be here uh, and moving them to here. It's taking somebody who's here and moving them to here. I mean, moving them as high as, making them the best that they could be. And for me, it's, uh, it's development of talent and giving people an environment where uh, where they can really shine. So, you know, I give you my example where I could have been fired or I could have, you know, moved through this organization. I happen to have somebody who allowed me to shine. And, you know, I, I, I say that with, uh, you know, with every employee and anybody I get to, to work with. It's, it's creating that environment. I have a real problem with authority figures. Uh, and That's why we're all here, by the way. And <laughs> being part of a company where they kind of own you in your time, in your mind, in, in your being, uh, or your title or whatever, that really bothers me. What I'm most proud about with my company is I, I own my time. If I choose not to have another product for the next year or two, it's my decision. If I want to not go to work next week or tomorrow or today, actually, you know, I just do it. There's nobody watching, looking at what I'm up to, which product I choose, what silliness I get involved with, or, you know, or, so that's, that's what I'm most proud of, that I own me. I think a similar point, I'd, I mean, I'd love to have a big tall rock that says everything about me being a great father and a great husband and a, uh, an innovator and a leader. And so I want all that stuff, but I think ab above everything else, it's uh, that I was authentic. And for me, it's, it's very hard to do that when you have that authority uh, over you and it's usually part of a large system of people that you didn't have part of building and I think when you put two people together um, their combined brain power is about 1.8 people and you just multiply that out <laughs> it's it's a reverse scale thing so at least in this in, in this model we own that scale. So um, I think that allows you to say, you know what, we really screwed, screwed up, and that means that I screwed up. That was my idea. Uh, and every once in a while, we knocked it out of the park, and I had a lot to do with that. It was myself um, kind of being able to, to replicate that idea. Uh -huh. 
Could you speak a little bit about how the habit and culture of your entrepreneurial thinking has changed the lives of people close to you and by extension the communities around you? And background for this question is that I was involved, I was, was starting an internet uh, venture here in Charlottesville 10 years ago and uh, we collected a whole lot of business cards and a whole lot of slaps on the back and the general atmosphere was more or less dampening and nothing really beyond the angel funding got started and then everything ended. But it seemed to me that the entrepreneurial spirit could catch fire if, if there were enough dry kindling around. So I wonder how you've managed to set entrepreneurial thinking afire in the towns where you live. So, That's how you build a conversation. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so I can tell you, I, you know, I share a little bit about. Uh, I, I'm less at a community level and more at an individual level. So when I look at PaySimple, you know, nothing would make me happier than to see, you know, when we sell and we've got, you know, we've got institutional money behind us. So at some point, you know, the business is going to get sold. You know, I would love to see ten more businesses sprout out of the leadership uh, that came through PaySimple. And so for me, you know, I see it at, as a, at an individual level. Uh, I'm not necessarily going out trying to create, you know, a community of entrepreneurs, uh, but it's creating a person, an individual, and getting that fire lit. So I, you know, I've shared, uh, you know, sort of my fear as far as what held me back from getting started in it sooner. You know, I don't want that fear to exist in, in those people. Uh, and I want them to be able to just have the confidence in who they are to go out and do their own businesses you know, when they have that opportunity. And you know, if our best employee tomorrow said, you know, I want to go out and start my own business, you know, I would give them the biggest hug and say, congratulations, what can I do to help? And for me, you know, that, that's what it's about. Uh, Charlottesville is a, a great community uh, for entrepreneurship. And, uh, uh, and I think you know, participating in it and uh, in, there's all kinds of social networks that, have, that take place. There's hiring of students every summer that we try to do, working with faculty members, you're screening all kinds of different uh, proposals, people have ideas. You know, if company sells, adenosine therapeutics just sold, well, there's a lot of angel investors now who have more capital. You know, if I can have a huge success uh, to create more capital in this community and other communities to foster other companies, you know, that's, that's a really a great thing. Yeah. And uh, I think that's one of the things the entrepreneur community can do is have, have successes, right? More successes creates more capital, more capital creates more jobs. That would be terrific. I'd just like to amplify one thing that Jeff talked about earlier, which is, is that essentially fear and confidence. Okay, and that is, is that I've, I've had the, uh, I've unfortunately been in the corporate world most of my life. I've been unfortunately successful at what I do, and I much prefer the entrepreneurial life. And essentially his point is, is, is that, you, what's nice about being an entrepreneur is, is it's sort of the can do versus can't do. Yes. Okay? And when you're in a big bureaucracy, it's a lot of people who say you can't do it versus when you're with entrepreneurs who say you can do it and think about, you know, the word can't doesn't even exist. And to me, that becomes a huge motivator of why you want to go to work because you're with other people who think positively instead of negatively. And just like a father of kids, you never want your kids to think that they're not capable of doing something. Right? And similarly, you want to work with people like that. And to me, that's frankly the debilitating thing about being in a bureaucracy is you have so many risk managers and lawyers who give you reasons why you can't do something. And to me, that is you know, why I keep flipping back to trying to do entrepreneurial stuff. I think it's the two people with 1.8 brains. <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he just articulated it perfectly, which is, I mean, that was my exact experience. Every corporation I've been in, you always have people that say, you know, we can't do this because. And you will hear that so many times in a, in a corporation, and it was never, I mean, it's never like that in the entrepreneur environment, because, I mean, can't, can't be part of your vocabulary. It's gotta be, how do we do it? You know, there's always a way to figure this out, and you find a way to figure it out. So, I mean, Sam talked earlier about, you know, whenever they were faced with something hard, you know, they believed in themselves, and they found a way to pull in more revenue. They found a way to get another client. And I don't, it's hard to describe, but you just do. I mean, you, you just find a way to do it. So, so I don't, quite agree. Because anybody who's raised venture capital money has been around a lot of people who say, oh, this isn't going to work. You're not going to be able to do this. I mean, raising money is about rejection. 
Um, so there are plenty of opportunities as an entrepreneur to get rejection, get naysayers all around you. And we actually have some data that, that some faculty um, have generated, Gene Litka in particular, about entrepreneurs in corporations. Well, it turns out they look a lot like entrepreneurs in their garages. Uh, but they generally have a patron. They have someone who moves the naysayers out of their way and allows them to be successful. But they're doing exactly what these guys are doing. They're taking resources, they're making do, they have this attitude, well, if we can't do it this way, we'll do it this way. They ask for forgiveness, not for permission. You can be very entrepreneurial in a corporation. You just need a different set of, of circumstances. And having been an entrepreneur, it is really frustrating. You, you are around a lot of people, especially in the beginning, who will tell you all the reasons why what you want to do doesn't work. Um, so it's, it's, it's not always rosy. So, so he, he's right, particularly when you go out to see the venture capitalist. I mean, you will hear, and part of it, it honestly, part of it's a game, which is, you know, they may be, I mean, there's some that are just not going to be interested in you. There are some that are going to be interested in you, but they're not going to let you know they're interested, they're interested in you. And they're going to play down, you know, what's your worth. Well, you know, you've got this issue and this issue and this issue and this issue. And it's all about valuation goes from here to here to here to here to here. Um, and, you know, you've got to be, you've got to be able to hear no. Um, but I think it still goes back to the point, though, that if you believe you're going to get there, you're going to get there. And it's just, I mean, if we would have said no after the first five venture capitalists, it's, I mean, if we would have just given up after the first five venture capitalists said no to us, then we would have been done a long time ago. Um, but, you know, you, you keep at it and you find, you find somebody that says yes. And uh, an, an interesting fact, a little bit off topic, but an interesting fact is, you know, when I talked to uh, venture capitalists on the East Coast, we were talking, Sam and I were talking about this this morning, a lot of the VCs on the East Coast are a lot of MBA types, very analytical, and for them, it's very cut and dry. They will run discounted cash flow models till you die. And it will either show it works. Actually, most of those are now unemployed. Exactly. And they'll either show it works or it won't work. The, honestly, a lot of the West Coast uh, venture capitalists, you talk to them and it's about the idea. It's about, it's more intuition. And you still got to have a model that makes sense. And it's got to have to pay off. But, you know, they're willing to take a bigger bet. And it's, it was just an interesting, you know, after going through that and spending time on both sides of the Mississippi, you know, it was very clear to me the way one group thought versus another. Patricia, you get the last word. <laughs> I feel like now I'm like Cher or Bono, and that's the only name you need to give me. Uh, a comment and a question for you guys, and, and the question just has a real quick answer, but uh, there's several of us in this room that are part of the Virginia Active Angel Network, and we're a, a angel early in seed starts, you know, seed stage investing group here. So uh, we feel your pain, and because we've seen probably over three years, about 300 proposals submitted to our website we never run discounted cash flows because there is no such thing in early and seed stage. And one guy even, you know, put up on his PowerPoint when he got to the financials a hockey stick off of, uh, you know, clip and paste or something from online. He didn't even said, didn't even put his financials up there because there's just no unique model that fits everybody across that. And we say no to a lot of people because we can only see two presentations a month yeah. uh, for the past five years. So uh, it is difficult. It's difficult for us to say no, and it's difficult for us to remind the people that we say no to every month when we tell them what the outcome was because we invest about 150 to 600,000, and we have about 14 companies. It's we try to remind them that even if this isn't good for our group, these guys might come back richer than God someday. So we try to tell our investors don't. Don't slam them. Don't talk about it in public. Don't say, "Yeah, I saw that," and it sucked. You know, it's a small community, and it's and it gets a lot bigger. But, but uh, so I, we feel your pain. The question I'd ask you guys is: Have any of you ever been fired from a company? And did that have any effect, or did forget what you know? I guess this includes leaving right before you knew you were going to get fired. <laughs> or did that just never happen to you all? And those are quick answers. Uh, I had a really horrible boss on my last job, and she would not only be yelling at us, her direct superior, direct subordinates, she would have us keep secret about her yelling at us because she managed up much. I mean, she was yeah. phenomenal. So I knew it was coming. I was pushed into an area of the company that really was 
not a place I could ever really get it, uh, advancement. And so that's where I was, and that's when I left. And I wrote my one-page letter to the, my angel investor proposing my business. They called me back two days later. We negotiated that week, and I was gone within the month, and I started my business. So you never got fired, or you were about to get fired? I was about to get okay. fired. Yeah, pretty much. It's like a bad date. you got to get out of it before they dump you. So there is a question a lot of people are asking is in this environment, are more entrepreneurs entrepreneurial <laughs> by necessity? And, and my observation is, in a way, yes. I mean, some of the best and brightest of our students who would be getting, you know, high six-figure or mid-six-figure salaries are not getting them. And they're often the brightest and most entrepreneurial because frankly being a really good banker is entrepreneurial. Um, are in fact saying, I want to be, you know, I want to be wealthy, I want to be master of my destiny and they become entrepreneurial <coughs> at a higher rate now than I think they were before. So I, I would have gotten fired twice. Uh, but I was you got too, out right before I was too impatient. To, I got frustrated before I, I could get fired. But and, you knew you were gonna have I did. And in both situations actually the person I worked for ended up getting fired before I did. So it was, I, I just went and gave my resignation and I said, well, hold on a second. And then, but it was a matter of me just getting frustrated before I could get fired. But I clearly would have been. And nobody else got fired. I left before getting fired. <laughs> I thought nobody you were going to get fired too. <laughs> okay. I was, I was right. And Andy, nobody would fire you. No, so you're <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.